Welcome to the Niche Pursuits Podcast. Today we're joined by James Beatty, and he is here to tell his story about starting a website in 2021 and selling it at the very end of 2022. This website at its peak was getting uh, almost $8,000 a month in revenue, um, nearing 400,000 page views a month. Uh, and then when he sold it, it had taken a dip. It got hit by an update or two towards the tail end of 2022. So we get to hear the story from the website's first few days all the way to what he was doing to grow the site, what types of keyword research and keywords he was going after, how he was creating the content, what types of topics he focused on into 2022 as he scaled the site, hired on writers, started pumping out a lot of content. Um, Obviously a great success story, even though it did take a little bit of a hit, he did sell it for six figures towards the end of last year. I think perhaps my favorite part of this interview though, is not just all the tactics that he shared to grow the site, but we also get into a lot of the mind games and a lot of the mental aspect of starting a website, growing a website, and then selling a website. A lot of the times we don't get to talk about those things, but James shares openly about the ups and the downs that went along with this project. He shares openly about um, getting hit by a Google update and what that does to your, um, your emotions, what it does to your drive and your motivation. We talk about, hey, when is the right time to sell? Like, Do you, do you, do you take money off the table uh, or do you try to wait for that ultimate moment when the site is on the rise, but you feel like you've capitalized on it? Um, he gets into his thoughts on AI. That was an influence in why he chose to sell the site. I think he had some really interesting thoughts to share. We do finish by talking about AI and what he's doing on his next projects to incorporate AI, to incorporate video, to incorporate some of these things that he thinks are gonna be the difference maker going forward. I hope you enjoy. Introducing nichesites.com. Are you looking to scale your niche site portfolio or build your first website? Look no further than nichesites.com. With a portfolio of successful websites and over 700 plus satisfied clients, the folks at nichesites.com have the skills and experience to help you succeed. From keyword research to link building, content writing to done for you websites, nichesites.com offers a full range of services to help your content site grow. As the saying goes, a trial is worth more than a thousand words and they're offering a special trial just for new customers. You get 5,000 words of content completely free with your order of 10,000 plus traffic backlinks. Don't miss this opportunity. Head on over to nichesites.com slash trial and take advantage of this amazing trial offer. Again, it's niche sites, plural, nichesites.com slash trial. Go claim your free content today. Before we jump into the podcast, I wanted to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. Here's a short clip of Ferry from Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. In this video, I will show you how we landed a placement on BBC and dozens of links in massive regional online publications such as Wares Online, Daily Post, and many more. This PR campaign was about the easiest place to pass your driving test for the first time in the UK. This is how we've done it. We simply went to DVLA website, found the latest car driving test data by test center and downloaded the data in a CSV format. Once we had the data, all we had to do is to look at the number of total tests per test center, then look at the number of first time passes to calculate the percentage of people who passed their tests for the first time. Once we had the percentage numbers, we created a press release with our findings. Then we went to Roxhill and found journalists who talk about driving tests and also looked for journalists who write in regional publications in the UK. In total, we have found about 1,800 journalists and sent them our press release by email. Within less than a day, our story got picked up by BBC, Cornwall Live, Wells Online, and dozens of other publications in the UK, providing our client a tsunami of backlinks perfectly relevant to the audience of the client who is a specialist in learner driver car insurance. I hope this video is helpful and it shows you how you can also build links with freely available data from official sources. If you want similar link building PR campaigns for your website, head to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them now.
welcome back to the Niche Pursuits podcast. My name is Jared Bauman, and today we are joined by James Beattie. James, welcome on board. Thanks for having me. It's good to have you. It's good to have you. I'm excited for what we're doing today. I mean, uh, you, you basically just sold a website, and I, I love it when we just get to deep dive into a single website and a single, a single site that you grew. Um, before we get into those details, though, tell us about yourself. Give us some background and, and tell us, uh, kind of maybe catch us up to the point where the website was started. Yeah, so pretty much since 2015, 2016, I've been working full time online. Um, I used to work a corporate job for a year just after I come out of school. And then I started doing e-commerce and did pretty well with e-commerce, mainly doing drop shipping stuff, running pet ads right through from 2015 to 2020. Uh, that was kind of my main thing and did a lot of drop shipping and then also did a lot of kind of YouTube and, and teaching pet ads. So did that right up until pretty much lockdown. Um, and then just kind of got sick of the, the, the kind of, there's a lot of issues with Facebook ads and account bans and stuff like that and just headaches. And I was kind of looking for something a little bit more, you know, passive and, and hands off and, you know, not dealing with product, not dealing with support. And I was kind of just in limbo for that 2020 lockdown year. I think it kind of rattled me a little bit and it was just honestly didn't do too much that year. Uh, and then in 2021, that's when I was kind of looking for something else to do a project to kind of dig into and started doing the, the niche site because it kind of ticked all those boxes of what I wanted. And it's definitely not passive, but you know, you can go away for three, four days, not look at it and it'll still be there when you come back versus e-commerce where if you do that you've got 600 you know if you don't have a team in place or whatever there's a lot of pieces and you've either got you know your your employees messaging you saying this is happening we need this done whereas with a, a site you kind of you know it's it's pretty passive where if you've got content up there it'll continue to rank it'll continue to pull in revenue unless you get slapped by google but there's not really much you can do in that three-day period anyway so it was kind of ticking all those boxes um, for a business model to get into. So that's kind of when I picked that up and started fairly slowly, um, you know, with, with building the website because I wasn't sure it's a, it's a very long, you know, a very long kind of period between posting your first article and mm. getting some sort of decent revenue, which is very different compared to e-commerce where, you know, you put an ad up right now, you could have sales coming in in two, three hours and you can see what's working and it's, it's very quick. Uh, on the pet ad side. So I'd, I'd never kind of done organic traffic and um, free traffic was kind of mind blowing to me from the, you know, coming from that pet ad side. So it was a, it was a very different world, but there was also a lot of stuff that could obviously be applied and building websites and stuff like that. It made it probably a little easier for me than someone coming in completely from scratch. You know, I want to ask you about those because you're, you're exactly right. I, I don't, I don't want to say it's rare, but certainly the things that are involved in e-commerce are in so many ways almost the opposite of what's involved in website building, right? Or at least in content affiliate website building. Affiliate, yep. you're, you're really saying, I don't want to deal with all of the <laughs> inventory hassle, the customer service hassle, all of the product replacement and SKUs and all these things. That's affiliate marketing. And then in e-commerce, you're, 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 you're all the way up to your elbows, right? In, in that kind of stuff. What, um, you mentioned that you didn't do a lot of organic with your e-commerce brand, but you were doing paid ads. Um, what, how did you end up growing that e-commerce brand? Was it on the back of paid ads? And then, um, you know, I, th I guess, where, where did you end up getting that to at some point? Yeah, so like back in, we, we pretty much did drop shipping stores and we would do a lot of different, just random, like they're called general stores kind of in the space. And essentially the model is you're drop shipping from, you know, you start probably from AliExpress or Alibaba just initially to test a lot of products. And then you can go ahead and once you get some traction, you can then go ahead and start bringing those products into a, to a 3PL or like a fulfillment service. Uh, and then you can start shipping them out there. But mainly we did, so we did a lot of in the, in the early days that AliExpress stuff and we did millions in, in revenue. But wow. again, that's very different than, than profit. So yep. it's, you know, when you start out a product, the profit margins are great, but as you start diluting audiences on Facebook, they'll get narrower and narrower. So, you know, sometimes it'll be 30%, other times it'll be 10%. I'd say overall throughout the, 
three or four years I was doing it, you know, I probably netted out about 10, 15% profit margins on it. So it's like a lot of work and it looks flashy in the screenshots and stuff like that, but it's not, you know, there's a lot goes into the back end of that and the profits aren't, aren't as good, but you know, it's mainly just Facebook ads. You can, you can start up a store and when you like, especially back in like 2016, mm -hmm. if you just hit the right offer. You just, you know, if, if you're putting in $5 in ads and you're selling the product at 20, costs you five, you're making $10 profit a product, you just start spending hundreds a day and you just up that budget and you can, because it's drop shipping, you, you know, you've good cash flow. Whereas if you're holding inventory, I think, you know, that then really throttles your growth because there's a lot of cash flow issues and, you know, you're waiting a month to get stuff and that can kind of, you know, hurt, like give you a big hurdle. But when you're drop shipping, you can really just scale rapidly. And some of this stuff in, like, I, I wasn't one of the biggest people that I seen do it. There was people like literally would run hundreds of thousands of ads a day pumping out these and seeing and seeing numbers but yeah it's just pad ads is kind of it's a very different game and you put money in if it's profitable you know put more money in <laughs> yeah and those were uh, i don't want to say dramatically different days but pre you know covid and global supply chain and ad costs going up so much and all that so it's um it's a good point i mean so as we transition to the period in 2021 where you started what would be more along the lines of an affiliate style site or a niche site what do you think, we've talked about the differences, but I'm curious, what do you think were some similarities that you were able to pull over from your e-commerce experience? What were some things that, like you said, gave you a bit of a leg up that you had learned on the e-commerce side that you were able to apply? And I'm thinking about people out there who might have an e-commerce background. We have a lot of people listening who maybe work at agencies that do e-com or work on their own e-com site, might be thinking about going down the, the, the affiliate style website route. What similarities did you draw or did you think gave you an advantage? I think kind of, you know, the, the main thing, the whole like website setup and doing the kind of, I'm not, I'm no web dev, but I can web up a WordPress website or a Shopify website in, in a couple of hours. So that obviously, you know, there was no kind of technical troubles with installing a plugin or, or, or doing a little bit of HTML editing and stuff like that. So that definitely helped in, mm. in one aspect. And then also just, I think just being through that online business and knowing that it's something that works. And I think a lot of people are very skeptical and I don't think get, getting into the, the web, the passive website or the, you know, affiliate websites and stuff like that, because it takes so long to work. I think again, so many people just give up early, but just from what I'd seen in e-commerce of, oh, I see this guy doing this, it, it works. I, there's no reason I can't do that too. It was the same in this space where I was seeing a lot of people, it was working for them. So I thought, you know, I'll, I'll give it a go. And I was willing to stick it out long enough to, to see the results. Um, and then obviously you've got stuff like copyright and stuff. You do copywriting for Facebook ads and writing, like I used to do webinars and stuff like that. So I, I would write like long form sales letters. So that definitely applies a little bit when you're, you know, doing an affiliate review article and conversion rate optimization and stuff like that as well. So, and then also the team side of things where I'd done a lot of, you know, working with VAs in the Philippines and stuff like that. So I had experience with being able to hire them people and hire writers uh, and kind of put some systems together to get them working um, when starting off with the, the, the affiliate site. Yeah, yeah, no, all good points. Yep, all those things, super applicable to running a website uh, and growing a, uh, an affiliate style website. So, I mean, I, I want to just dive in and unpack everything you did. Um, before we get into all the details, I always love to do this because I think it helps people set the stage for where we're going to end up. Maybe tell us, um, whatever you're comfortable sharing, some of the peak traffic, earning numbers, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, you did end up selling this site. So, um, hey, spoiler alert. <laughs> and you, you had a, a great exit on it. And then once we get that out of the way, then we can drill into the nuts and bolts of the last you know, couple of years that you've spent since 2021 building it. Yeah, so I've, I'll pull up a little spreadsheet here. I can go through the, the actual numbers. So uh, in 2021, that was kind of the first year of the site. It was fairly slow getting started. And the amount of articles I was posting was probably like, 10 to 15 a month for the first six months mm -hmm. and then kind of pushed a little harder. But in the first year it did $6,000 or so in revenue and $3,000 in profit. So it wasn't anything crazy. Um, we just, we hit like 96,000 page views in December that year. And I started it in January. 
Uh, and then peak was August of 22, where we did 365,000 page views, and that was about 7,700 uh, in revenue with about five grand in profit. So that's kind of that was kind of the peak of the site in uh, August, and then unfortunately got hit by a Google update uh, at that point. Uh, and then that's when I looked to to list the website. Um, so we, we had an initial hit in. I think it was in September, and then we also had a hit, I think, in the October update, possibly, as well. So that definitely, at that point, I was kind of like, okay, I should probably take some money off the table. When I initially listed the site, I was hoping to sell it for a lot more than we ended up selling it for. Um, but it was definitely a good like learning experience in that two years that, that I can take away and, and push in. But there was also, when selling it, kind of chat GPT had just come out, and you're seeing all this AI stuff. Things are changing very, very fast in in this space. So I was kind of happy to to offload it and you know be able to just have you know a pot of cash there that I can now work with and still do website stuff, but possibly think about you know doing something a little bit different and just seeing how this AI thing plays out. It's always good to take some cash off the table, you know. Um, we had um, we had Michael Donovan on a couple, well, probably a couple months ago now. And he had, I don't want to say a similar experience, but growing a site, working on it, um, and it had, um, it had a rapid growth rate, then got hit uh, and had a downturn for a little bit. Um, and he ended up selling it and walking away with still what was a great sum of money. And we were joking about the fact that, well, you know, would you have been happy if you, if you hadn't have had a little bit of the downturn on the tail end and you had just said to yourself, I started this website two, three years ago and I'm walking away with this much after the sale – and he's like, I would have been totally happy with it, right? So perspective helps give that. And you're able to walk away from a, a site selling it for a good amount and um, with really less than two years in on it. I think that's also the remarkable thing about it. So um, congratulations. I think as well, like if you took, so even where the site dipped to, if that's all I ever got to, but it was just gone up in a smooth line upwards, like it's so much less stress just when things are going up. But once something goes down, it's a lot of stress, and you're thinking, is it just going to disappear? You don't really know what's going on. So, you know, it's maybe nicer just to have that a slower growth, but smooth. Because we did, like, a lot of the time, just double month over month, and things were going really, really well. And then you, you got hit, and it was really hard to understand why we're getting hit. You know, what's the difference between the sites that are getting hit and not getting hit? And, you know, we hand wrote everything. We had good expert writers i wrote probably half of the content and it's it's very hard to diagnose what's going on mm -hmm. well and that was also the time period i mean september october i i don't remember all of them but we had like a core update we had the very first helpful content update i think we had a spam update i think we had a product review update i mean it was hard to even keep your head screwed on straight knowing what was happening and i think when when Google uh, launches that many updates in a three to six month period, like you're just by sheer, you know, numbers, there's some natural increase in chance that you're going to get caught up in an update and your site wasn't that old yet, you know, which um, data would show that increases the chances, you know, like uh, uh, younger sites get wrapped up. So it, you know, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to, hard to understand. I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And it's like, you know, you there's no Google don't give any indication. There's no, you know, this is what's wrong with your site. Like it's you're just completely in the dark and you're trying to, you're changing stuff, but you're probably changing stuff that's perfectly fine because you don't know what. And it's very hard to like. I think I, I'm looking at the numbers here on the on the spreadsheet, and in that September month, I was like just push more and more content. I think we did like 165 articles that month compared wow. to like an average of 60. I was just like, just put more content out there that'll grow the traffic again. And if it, new content was ranking perfectly fine, like we didn't seem to be hindered in any way, you know, on, on articles ranking, we'd still put it up a couple hours later, it would be in the first, second page and slowly work its way up. And it was just kind of older content seemed to fall out. We got the snippet ban, which was kind of huge for us. So I think we lost about 20 or 30% from that. So that was, was massive. Yep. Man, you're saying all the things that uh, every uh, niche website owner was was going through and and perhaps still is going through. So I want to unpack this if we can. Um, I want to get into yeah. – there's so many things we could talk about. Um, 
I do want to hear from you though, some, uh, how you selected the niche all the way back in 2021 and it, you know, I mean, any tips for people who are sitting on the fence, waiting to pick a niche, uh, tips, maybe you went through from when you were selecting it or tips looking back now on the niche you selected and things you might've done differently. Yeah. So the, the main reason I did it was cause I was over lockdown in that 2020 period. I was actually taking part in this hobby and doing it. Um, so when I, when I came across niche websites and I was looking at a lot of the, the stuff that you had to do in terms of keyword research and how to find like low competition topics, a lot of that I'd experienced personally when I was trying to set up in this hobby myself and I'd go and I, I'd remember like, Oh, whenever I was doing this, I was searching for articles on how to set X, Y, Z up. And there, it would, I was on a lot of forums. A lot of the time there wasn't good guides. There was a lot of back and forth. And I thought, well, there, there's a gap here. And then when I did kind of more diving deeper into the research, there wasn't that many sites in the niche. There was probably, there was one big player who was like the main competition I'd say. And then there was probably at the start four or five other websites doing similar to, to what we ended up doing. Um, but they weren't massive. They were doing 40, 50,000 page views a month. The, the main player on the site, he was maybe doing 400 to 600,000. So I knew there was potential there. And I knew that, you know, even if there's only four or five other people doing it, you're still on the first page for, for most terms, if you, you can rank for that. Um, so in the early days, there wasn't much competition and I was already doing the niche. And I think that's huge because, you know, I've started a ton of sites uh, as most probably do. Uh, since I started that one, most of them ended up just, it's actually paying off now because they're sitting there ready to like start adding content to, but at the time they just kind of left for dead because I couldn't write. If, if, if I don't know about a topic or I'm not interested in it, I can't sit down and write two, three articles a day on right. that. Whereas on the niche I picked initially, I knew it, I had experience in it. I could sit down and write an article without doing very much research. So I think if you're getting into a niche website now, and especially now, because I think the game's changed a little bit where you really need kind of experience, you probably want to be doing some form of videos and maybe content on TikTok, shorts, stuff like that. I think you have to have some sort of passion in it. And, you know, if you, that's a huge advantage over someone who's just, you know, like if someone's writing about a topic that they don't know about and don't like, the content can't be that good. Like it, it can only be so good. So if you're passionate about it, you're knowledgeable about it and you know, you can sit down and write on it every day and enjoy it. It's going to be so much easier to, to work in that niche. And I think even if there is a lot of competition, I still think there's probably room if you are, you know, passionate about it and you want to build a brand around it. You ended up writing a lot of the content yourself. And so it certainly sounds like you attribute not only your interest in it, but your experience in the subject. Uh, how important for you was prior experience to creating that content? And what I mean is, <clears throat> excuse me, I have something in my throat. What I mean is, um, you know, uh, some might say, well, it's okay to pick a niche that you have a passion for, but maybe don't know much about yet, because while you're researching it, while you're learning about it, you can write about it. You seem to have a pretty good amount of experience already with it. I'm just curious your take on that difference there. It might be nuanced, but you have a passion, but you also have experience. I think it's fine. Like, I mean, I wasn't by experience in it. I'd just done it as a, as a hobby over 2020. I was by no means like an expert or mm -hmm. one of the best in the industry. I was just a, a bog standard. I was just figuring it out in 2020 and I definitely could have as you know, if let's say you're, you're doing something in, you know, the, a computer niche and it's how to set up a, you know, a monitor for the perfect graphics or whatever it is, you, you know, you're going to do that process. You look at your monitor, you research a couple of articles, you watch a couple of videos. Well, now you're an expert in setting that up. Did you get to the goal that you set out to do? Well, if that's the goal of your article and you know how to do that, you're as much as an expert as you need to be to help someone else. So I think as long as you're always one step ahead of the person that you're teaching or writing for, I think you're, you're completely fine. And I think a lot of the time as well, especially with like YouTube and, and TikTok, if you're like documenting your journey, I think that's as much, you know, uh, as like fun to watch for people, especially it's more relatable. 
I know like I'm getting fairly like deep into running right now. And like I watch a lot of content who are people who are maybe just a step ahead of me. Like I don't want to watch elite runners run because I'm never mm. going to be that. But watching people who, you know, are just maybe a little bit better than me or who are like hitting goals that maybe I want to hit a few years down the line. I like watching them because it's it's more relatable. So as long as like you're, anyone can really do it in terms of, you know, just being a little bit ahead of whoever you're making that content for. Bring up some really good points. It's a really good point. And um, you're obviously speaking about the value of video. Did you incorporate video into this project? Or is that more something that you're thinking about doing on a future project? I, I did. Probably not as much as I should have. It was mainly just like tutorial content. We did eventually get this, the, the channel monetized. I think we had about 2,000 subscribers. Okay. Um, so it, it did okay. And we got like a couple of videos that were like 60,000. I think a couple maybe had 100,000 views. Um, and they were just tutorial videos. Like they weren't hard to make or anything. It was just, oh, I've got this article. It's doing well on my site. I'm going to make a YouTube video on that. And a lot of the times we would find that, especially whenever there was a stage last year when uh, Google introduced a lot of videos, yeah. especially for tutorial articles in that top spot. So yep. a lot of them, we would have a video in one of them three and then also have our article below. So we were probably getting a lot of traffic from Google search, uh, which obviously then helps on YouTube. And, and most of our, I would say most of our views on YouTube were uh, through like YouTube search rather than recommended. There weren't videos that would do well, like just being sent out to a random audience. Um, but yeah, I think there's probably room. We probably could have done more with that. And if I had kept the site, it's definitely something I would have focused on more moving forward. Mm, good tips. Uh, let's see. I have some notes from earlier. You were saying you were doing about 10 to 15 articles a month there in that, in that first year. Um, and you, by December of 2021, you were getting 96,000 page views. Now, that's pretty good for a, a pretty new site. I mean, you're still less than a year old, and you're getting 96,000 page views. What type of articles were you writing? What type of keywords were you going after? It sounds like they were very question-oriented, tutorial-based, but I'm kind of reading into it there. Maybe talk us through that because you downplayed it, but that's, that's a good amount of traffic um, for less than a year in. Yeah. So yeah, as you said, most of them were kind of questions, tutorial style articles. Um, I pretty much started initially just going after those things in my head that I knew I struggled with whenever I was getting started. And at that point, I didn't really know much about niche sites when I was starting out. And I didn't really, I didn't know anything about SEO, to be honest. I, I still don't think of myself as someone who like overly knows much about SEO. I think it's more I was just thinking to myself, what site would I want as a person coming into this niche and what would I want? So I started off with, you know, low competition topics and going after them initially. But I was also thinking, I want a user to be able to come to my site and follow a path to get to a goal. And that maybe takes 10, 15 articles. And not everyone's going to need to read every one, but I wanted that full guidance there for someone coming in and I built a lot of, so like back in the, in the e-commerce days, I built courses for Facebook ads and stuff mm. like that. So I kind of knew the process of building that out on what someone wants when they're flowing through, like how do I do or how do I get a goal? So I was building out and started with the low competition stuff to get that traffic rolling in. But I also filled in them gaps, even in stuff that I knew I wasn't, you know, enough of an authority to rank for. I would still go ahead and fill them pieces of content in because I felt that it was useful for readers who maybe needed that as their next step. And, you know, it might not be looking back now, I didn't realize at the time, but I was building like topical silos. Yeah. And I didn't know at the time, but that's essentially what, it, what I think I was probably doing and then just building them out. So for example, if I was doing, you know, if you're doing Canva tutorials, I would, go on Ahrefs, use low fruits, something like that. Find all the low competition Canva stuff that you can go after and go after them first because they're going to be the ones that get you that traffic. And I think getting like your first dollar, getting your first hundred visitors, that's like the most important thing to keep that dopamine hidden, to keep writing. And then fill in the harder ones and just go through the difficulty and just, you know, and then sometimes one of them ones that you think you'll never rank for just I don't maybe just by luck or I just accidentally did the stuff right, but it ranks and you start getting like 10,000 page views a month from an article that you never thought you could rank for. 
And maybe that's just that topical authority coming in and helping you reach that level for that. So yeah, that, that's kind of the, the strategy I, I used initially. It's funny to hear you mention it because that was going to be what I said next is it sounds like you brought your experience in funnel creation and landing page creation and you brought this experience from your previous business and without realizing it created topical authority because you really you didn't just start by going after the low competition keywords and i think that's where from interviewing people and talking to a lot of website builders a lot of people will get hooked on that low competition keyword um the long tail right but then they'll maybe bounce around topic to topic without realizing it going after those low vol those low competition keywords and then fail to kind of build out the silo and then down the road never really capitalize on what a true authority site could capitalize on but you were writing content for articles you had no business ranking for, but it sounds like it kind of helped your topical authority. And then you ended up ranking for a few of them. <laughs> yep. Well, for, for a certain period of time until Google said no, but <laughs> it, it worked initially. It did work initially. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um... Before we jump into the podcast, I wanted to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. Here's a short clip of Ferry from Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. This is how we landed massive links for our client in The Sun, a DR90 website, and many other UK news websites. We have used freely available data from YouGov to simply find out what the nation's favorite car brand is and which brands people love the most. Of course, Rolls-Royce came out on top Aston Martin 2nd and Jaguar 3rd. We put these insights in a short email and sent it to journalists that write about cars and to national news desks on behalf of our client. Within a few days our client got featured in all the suns as well as many regional newspaper sites in the UK gaining DR90 links to their leasing comparison website. Yugo website is full of unlimited PR stories with data already available for free. All you have to do is to start researching their data and start asking the data questions. You will be surprised of the unlimited PR campaigns that you will find there that can help you build massive exposure and links to your or your client's websites. I hope this video is helpful and inspirational. If you want similar link building PR campaigns for your website, head to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them now. In terms of monetization, I mean, as we were nearing the end of 2021, you're breaking into 100,000 page views. Like, were you writing much affiliate style content that could be monetized by, you know, affiliate offers and those sorts of things? Was this mostly a monetization play to generate revenue from an ad, an ad, uh, an ad platform like a, like a ad thrive media vine is these kind of places. Yeah. So I think around that time, 2021, I think was one of the, the first big like affiliate review updates. So like a lot of the stuff that I was hearing was like, don't put affiliate review content on your site. And there was a lot of talk about, uh, like balancing with this amount of informational articles and like 20% review. So, I don't think I did overly much in those early days. I can take a look like in December, it's probably not a good month to look at because December's affiliate heavy. But if you say like October of 21, I had like $750 in Ezoic revenue and then 113 of, of Amazon. Mm -hmm. And those yep. were the only two that I really used. So it wasn't really a focus at all on going after affiliate content in the early days. I did then start, I hired a writer specifically to do that type of content, probably mid 2022. And we did have a couple of articles that did really, really well for higher ticket stuff and ended up generating like a decent amount in affiliate revenue, but ads were always the main generator on the site. You talked about hiring writers and I wanted to ask when that transition happened. You were writing a lot of the content in the beginning 10 to 15 a month, something like that. And then you dropped a number where you were producing a lot more content in 2022. Uh, you hired writers. What was the impetus for that decision? Where did you find these writers and what kind of scale did it afford you? Yeah. So I think initially when I got into it, like I just wanted it to be super low risk and not have, you know, a huge outlay of money. So the site was never any more, like I never spent any more than a hundred dollars in like the being in the red 
on the site. So any riders that were ever hired came from profits from the site. Um, so I think I started, like as soon as I started making decent money, I, I can see here content writers started probably in like July of uh, the first year. And that was just like $240, $315. Oh, okay. uh, and that was pretty much everything the site was making at that point. And I was just reinvesting it. So we weren't getting many articles for that, but I, I was just trying to build out that team at that point and just get a little bit of extra help to keep publishing and keep that momentum going. Yeah. Um, but I, I was still publishing. Like I, in the, in the first year, I wasn't doing a huge amount because I still didn't know if it was a, a site that would work or would make any substantial money. It was probably just the tail end of, of 21 where I started taking it seriously and kind of pushed this to my main thing. Um, so I started writing, like I just get up and write pretty much like the full morning. And a lot of the articles I was writing were, were fairly short. So I, I struggled to sit down and, and some of the niches I'm in now, like it requires a 3000, 4000 word article. And I really struggled to sit down and write that. Like it, it's, it's hard. I need that like dopamine hit of pushing publish. So the niche I was in initially, like you could get a, a really good article out that answered the query in like six, 700 words. Sometimes it was more, sometimes slightly less, but I can sit down and write one of them in an hour, two hours max and publish three, four, five of them in a day. And that was for me the best way to do it. Now, like there's, it's definitely, I see a lot of people who are very selective over articles they write. You know, I see some people who have 200, 300 articles on their site and they're making a lot more money than I ever did. And they're, they're just, it's just a different strategy, right? And I, I don't know which is, is better. Um, probably right now, I would go after them very specific articles just with all the AI content, probably eating up stuff that I was able to rank for. Um, but yeah, I, I wrote most of that and then started to hire that team mainly in, in 2022 started to scale it up and I, it was over summer probably from like june to august i was doing a lot of traveling i don't think i wrote any articles in them three months and you can kind of see that in our uh, costs up them months because it just ramped up and i wanted to keep the same level of publishing but just with writers instead so we had them doing all of that content for for three months and i would just publish the articles at, at night or whatever uh and that was kind of kind of the main play. And again, it was just trying to get it to a point where it was as passive as possible. Like I did eventually want to take myself out of it, but I knew in them early days, if I didn't want, to, you can go two ways. You can use time or money to invest in content and push it. But again, it, it's something that I see a lot of, like I see some people and the strategy to me seems crazy spending like hundreds of thousands and they've only got, they've got like really no traffic at all yet. And I'm like, I could not do that. I couldn't stomach it. Um, but for them, you know, maybe in the long term, it just it, it plays out probably net better in some situations. But I just couldn't handle that sort of stress. <laughs> how many articles did you end up like? What was your peak month of publishing? Um, how many? Uh, were you publishing? I think it was actually probably the well, it was that 165 in September. That was the biggest month. Yeah. Um, but that was like an outlier because I was freaking out with the update and just. We need, we need to push more content, but uh, January of 22, I published 140 articles and I know I wrote a lot of that myself as well as content writers. I was the most productive month of my life by the looks of it. And then it averaged about 60 to 70 articles, kind of creeping up to a hundred over them summer months. And then that was that 165 month after in, in September there. Winter's a great time to crank out content. You know, it's dark, it's cold, there's not much to do. So you put the time to good, to put the time to good use. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, how, like, if I can ask, what were you doing? If you were reinvesting a lot of the profits and you weren't doing the e-commerce thing anymore, like, were you living on savings? Were you doing other things to supplement income? Um, or, you know, how were you kind of paying the bills as it were? Yeah. So, I mean, I had money coming in from, from other stuff. I've done YouTube for years. Uh, I had like affiliate stuff that I've promoted in the past that still pays good money. And I think that's something I'd like to focus on as well on my niche sites is uh, recurring affiliate programs. And I think that's, we can maybe talk about that in, in a little bit, but yeah, I had money coming in from that. I had savings and stuff um, as well. But even in, the, in them days, like the, they were still making fairly good money, 
like the profits in those months, even when we were investing a lot, I was still making four or five grand a month in profit. And even in them peak months, like the most I ever spent on content in the month was $3,000. So in our niche as well, you can get fairly cheap riders. There wasn't, you know, a need to spend 10 cents a word on a rider in that niche. So let's talk about when these updates started hitting because you had um, obviously published a lot of content. Summer of 2022, again, just looking at my notes here, um, August had 365,000 page views, $7,700 in revenue, over $5,000 in profit. Um, sounds like a lot of those costs were in writing, you know, so you could argue that you didn't need to spend that. That was for future growth, right? So that really the site could have earned almost $8,000 that month in pure profit. Um, and then these updates started to hit. What were your plans? What were you thinking for that site before the updates came? And then what was it about the updates that, you know, maybe caused you to change or, or modify that plan a bit? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's hard to know. I think when everything's going up, you're like, well, I'll just keep doing this because, you know, I, the kind of goal I think was to get it probably to about 20,000 a month and then sell it. And that's kind of where I, I wanted to get to. And everything was kind of going to plan. Everything was, was looking good. And I have kind of my theories about why it got hit. Um, a little bit, I think possibly, you know, once we started publishing all these, the niche I was in wasn't that big. And the articles that uh, it, it kind of eventually tapped out, we covered everything that we could. And then we branched into like a shoulder niche. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that affected the site um, potentially, but it, it's kind of like a, I feel like you're just gambling a little bit, like you're on a high. And I don't know if you've ever seen that, like, crypto rocket game where you ju it's just a gambling thing and it just goes up and up and you have to like cash out before it explodes yeah, i think that's right. kind yeah. of what <laughs> what i felt like i was playing or looking back that's kind of what it felt like you're just like i'll hold out another month before i sell and it, hopefully it just keeps going up until you know it doesn't so it's hard to it's hard to say but especially because it wasn't something that i wanted to like i, I didn't want to hold this brand for 10 years and continue publishing content in the niche I enjoyed it while I did it and you know I had a bit of knowledge in it but it's not it wasn't like my end goal so I knew at some point I wanted to sell and then them Google updates hit I just I was like right I'll I'll get out of this I'll take that money off the table that you know and cash in on those two years of work that I've done because it would suck to see it go to zero and not have anything for that really so that was kind of the, the thought process. I um I really appreciate you coming on and, and just sharing about the ups and the downs of this website because it's um like uh especially nowadays like sites are going through big ups and big downs and that's I don't know if I don't have a crystal ball I don't know if that's going to be the new norm but certainly 2022 probably had more updates than ever before and there's a bit of a stigma you know to kind of get your website nailed by an update um, but you know, not only did you start a really successful site and end up, uh, selling it for still a very, you know, uh, very decent amount, but I just appreciate that you're talking about it very rationally in terms of what you did really well. And then maybe some of the areas that, that, that might've caused it to get kind of wrapped up in something like a uh, Google updates, just really nice. Thanks for, thanks for sharing about those things. <laughs> yeah, no, I think as well, it's kind of like, I do like, I think the site is top quality and I do think it, it it could be the authority in the niche and it kind of hurts now because when I've sold it, looking at it, it's like they got, the person hasn't touched it. They haven't, I think they bought probably 10 sites at the time they were buying mine. So they were buying a lot and they haven't posted an article. They haven't updated anything. So it kind of sucks to see that, but you know, once you sell it, it's, you have no involvement in this, but I, I'd, I'd like to have even like stayed on maybe as like a, you know, a pet employee who are managing the site or something like that to continue to grow it. Cause I do think eventually it will rebound and, and come back, but you know, it's all well and good thinking that if, but if it, if it doesn't, then you haven't took the money off the table. And then you were seeing like, I, I think a lot of it was the reason to sell was the AI stuff. Like I really didn't know what was going to happen with that. Um, and then again, I think we're going into a, a recession. I, I don't, I think we're in a recession. They this seem to change the, the meaning of it or, or whatever, but like things are way more expensive. Companies are not making as much money. RPMs right. are cut in half seemingly across the board. So there was a lot going on that, you know, maybe 
if we were a year backwards, I maybe would have kept the side another year. But there was just so much saying it's probably time to take this money off the table. You're probably touching on a lot of things that website owners are thinking right now. Um, even yeah. the website owners that are holding on to their sites right now are probably still going through the same uh, mental gymnastics that you're going through and that you went through with this site, you know, which is, um, uh, you know, when to sell. And it's, it's, the, it's, it's the age-old question in this business of when is the right time to sell versus when is not the right time to sell. And, is, you know, at the same time, I always remind people that, um, you know, kind of like what you said, the new site owner hasn't touched it. Like if it's a project that you're not going to end up putting a lot of effort into say recovering, you know, after you hit that, got, uh, hit that Google update, then odds are it probably was a good move to sell it. You know, if you didn't have the energy and didn't want to put in all that effort to uh, fix some of the things and rebound it, you, you probably actually made a really good decision. And then obviously there is a case we made for knuckling down and really putting a lot of effort into it, but that takes a lot of work and there's no guarantees. Yeah, it's a, you know, you're, you're kind of rolling the dice, especially like it's not even, you know, I think Google probably as a company's freaking out right now. I, you know, they've launched their AI stuff. It doesn't seem to be as good as, you know, chat GPT and whatnot. And is Google search even going to be around in three, four years from now? There's just so many stuff or so much things that are up in the air that it's hard to, you know, it's hard to just say I'm a content site that gets traffic from Google search. I think diversity has to be you know massive in your in your strategy now um i'm putting it there's a lot of platform risk i think moving forward and it's you know i don't know if we could have got traffic like that from anywhere else and yeah so the, there was a lot of things just playing to the to the sell card let me ask you to kind of tie a bow on this website um, and whatever you're comfortable sharing. Like, did, did you sell this site for five figures, six figures? Like, um, you know, what kind of an exit did it end up being for you? So it was just over six figures. Um, it was, so there is a, a, like a performance bit. We got over six figures in cash and then there's like a 15% on top, which we'll see if we get, it was a six month period. Um, I sold it with, with empire flippers. So I, I was happy enough, but I did think like two months before that we were going to get double what, what I did get. So it was kind of like, I remember getting offers in the initial days when I listed it and being like, nah, no chance. I'm not taking that. And then those offers would have been nicer than what I did take in the, after that second update hit. So, um, yeah, it, it was, it was a very straight like that selling process and even though it's not it's a it's a decent chunk of money but like i can't imagine trying to go through like multi-million pound deals or multi-million dollar deals because i was very stressed out during that two months or whatever where you know things are up the an update rolls out whenever you've just got an offer and you're like is this gonna go through is it not and then he was buying 10 sites so there was you know it was a slow process it wasn't you know, there's a lot going on. So it was a, it was very interesting. I'm glad I went through that. And there's a, and before I even went through that, I think for the audience, like there's a lot of people buying sites out there that are like the, in, having like big VC firms uh, who have insane amounts of money or big publishing houses who have like some of the people I spoke to during that process, it was kind of mind blowing to me that these types of people were in this space. Because it seems just like a little hobby blog, but mm. there is big people out there who want them and they've got a lot of money to spend on them if you've got the right asset. So I think that was interesting to look at and definitely made me think about my next site that I build. Um, so yeah, that, that was very interesting. Well, congratulations. Six-figure sale. Nothing to sneeze at. I'm, I know you. Uh, hindsight's always a bummer. Uh, it's, it's so cruel because you have clarity about where things are now, but still six figure sales. So congrats. Well done. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about your plans going forward. And obviously so much of why you sold your site was to take money off the table. Um, uh, current global conditions, uh, the state of, uh, of, of building websites on the back of organic search. So I'm really curious now that this site uh, now the sale has been official for a couple months. Like what projects you're digging into and what you're focused on going forward. Yeah. I'll, I think 
I, I wish I had had this conversation with myself probably three months before I sold the site. But yeah, it's at, a, at the minute, like I've got a couple of sites going. We've, I have a new site. It's headed, probably going to head about 20,000 page views a month here. Um, so I'm putting a little bit of time into that and pushing AI on it and trying to use AI to see how that works out. And then I also have a, a running site that it's very, very small at the minute, but I posted a couple of articles on it a couple of years ago and they're ranked very well. So I'm thinking about kind of pushing that and maybe doing uh, some YouTube content and stuff around that. Um, but it's very much like in that shiny object syndrome stage because things aren't making a huge amount of money right now. So it's like, where do you go? Whereas if you've, it's nice to just have one thing to wake up every day and just mm -hmm. work on and you know it's making money and the more time you put in, the more money you make. Uh, so I think uh, I'm just kind of in this limbo period right now where I have my hands in a few different pies and just kind of waiting to see which one takes off and, and push it. You've talked about video a number of times and you know you did video but uh, on this website that you sold, but you know it doesn't sound like it was a big a big factor. How big of a factor or how big of an emphasis will you be placing on video on any of the projects you have going forward? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's huge. Like I, my personal YouTube channel, I have about 50,000 subs and I did YouTube pretty heavy back in 2018 to 2020 or whatever. And like, I know there's a lot of money there and there's a lot of potential. Like I, it's, I think it's a lot different and I'm sure you guys know, you know, from your podcast and you guys are, have a YouTube channel of a personality, like pushing something as a personality or recommending a product. I think it's so much easier than just some random article you read on the internet. Who are you going to trust more? I, I know if I'm buying something expensive, I want to watch a video of someone and see them review it and go through it. So I think, I think it has to be a part of your play, whether it's you or I see some people now doing, you know, they'll, they'll hire someone, they'll bring someone in to do that content on their brand. Cause I know not, everyone's comfortable getting on camera. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it has to be a part of your, your play. Like obviously there's going to be some outliers that, that do just fine without it. But if you want like a leg up and you want the fastest way to get into it and grow, I think you have to be doing it. AI, are you using it for any of your current projects? Um, how are you using it? You know? Yeah. So I pretty much with, you know, chat GPT and GPT three and 3.5. I honestly, I thought it was useless. I, I still like, sometimes I'll accidentally use 3.5 instead Same of here. four. <laughs> when I'm doing it. They, and, really, they really funnel you to 3.5 if you don't, if you don't yeah. pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want you using that one, but it's, it's so much worse. Like I would never have published an article straight off even a any of the, the AI writers tools I tried. I just kind of wrote it off. Like it's not something I'd want to publish or put on the internet. I don't think it provides anyone value. Um, whereas GPT-4, it has surprised me. Like it puts out articles that I feel I can upload this. It gets the user their question answered. It all makes sense. It seems to flow well. Like one of the biggest problems I had with the older version is it'll say something in this top paragraph, but then not acknowledge that it's said that in the bottom one, it'll repeat it or you know, it, it'll just make mistakes that a human writer wouldn't. Whereas now it seems to flow and understand context and stuff it's said before and won't repeat things. So it seems to be working really well. Um, I've been testing it out a couple of different ways. And I don't know, one of them is maybe a little gray hat or I don't know. <laughs> but like if you feed it three articles from on your keyword and then, you know, give it like a, a decent prompt of, what way to write it, how to write it. And I give it a template of a format I want to spit out that information in. It'll produce a pretty good article. And you essentially tell it to use them articles as the source instead of like just going out there and, you know, searching the whole internet and it does get some stuff wrong. It seems to get the facts a lot more right when you're using it like that. And I don't, in my head, it's essentially what you're telling a writer to do, right? Like if you're asking a writer to write a thing, they're going to go watch a YouTube video, read two articles and summarize the information in their words. And that seems to be, well, that in my head, that's what, what we're doing with AI now. So it's, it's only the last week or so I've started doing this. The articles are ranking um, and, and they answer the questions that they, they look good. They're not plagiarizing. So that's kind of how I've been using it. I'd like access to the, the API 
I haven't got it yet for the for the new version. Um, but yeah, I I think it's scary in terms of like how good it writes and what's going to happen with search. I think it's going to be flooded with articles in every niche, and I don't know how they're going to handle it. But it's a very big questions. I agree with you. <laughs> um, I'm curious with with Chat GPT four and what you're doing. Are you, it sounds like you're you're having it kind of construct an entire article for you. I've also heard a lot of people <clears throat> giving it specific prompts and then assembling the article from like five or six different prompts. Have you tested any of that at all? So the main thing I've been doing that seems to work well is just getting it to write that, give it a template and then get it to fill in the, the gaps in that template. So it works well for like, say you've got a batch of 20 articles that are similar formatting, like say you're doing top 10 best hotels in Paris in London, that's, you could maybe have 40 articles you're writing on 40 different cities. So that, that template's essentially the same for all of them. And then so you feed it that and then give it, you know, a prompt and give it information. It's a little manual because you have to feed it the articles that you want it to pull information from. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how I've been using it is just give it a template, give it a prompt of like how you want to write it, the style you want it wrote in. Um, and then feed it the content and tell it to pull specifically from that content. Very good. Very good. These conversations, we're going to be having a lot more of them, obviously. And uh, so, uh, you know, I just, uh, anybody who's kind of leaning into the AI world and, and producing content for it, um, I just would love, I just love getting your take on it. Um, hey, so it, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I think you kind of like, you, you kind of have to, especially if you're doing like, commodity style content like i see some people completely ignoring it like i think you had epic gardening on here like his stuff is just that's a different level of content he's doing the youtube he's doing you know the, the other platforms and the, you know that's that's different but if you're doing like you know these question and answer sites that are just going after you know simple terms like you can't afford you're just not going to be able to afford to compete with people who are using ai and you're even seeing you know the big big publishing houses using it as well so uh, i think like one of the, the the niches that i'm in they fired like 200 writers or something the other day and i don't know whether that's just simply cost cutting or they're going to start using ai as well to start producing stuff but i think you have to have a little bit or dabble in it at least until maybe don't put it on your main sites or whatever but it's there and i think a lot of people make a lot of money in the early days of it and yeah, I think it's an opportunity. I really like your top down approach, thinking about it as though, hey, a lot of times, depending on the style of content you write, and depending on the niche you're in, and depending on what type of keywords you're going after, what AI is producing and what you're instructing a writer to produce are very similar, you know? And again, if you're hiring a writer who's not an expert per se in the space, who isn't necessarily drawing on their own experiences when they write the article, a lot of what they're doing is uh, researching based on what's already out there. And so I think that's a good perspective for people to think about if they haven't thought about AI from that perspective, that certainly can help them understand a little bit better about where it could play in for them. Obviously, the element of bringing your own experience, like you talked about running, you're actually running, you're actually learning how to run. There are things that you're gonna be able to talk about from a running perspective that you know, that is brand new to the world, you know? And so there's a, it does place a different emphasis, whether you want to lean into it or not on experience and, and expertise and that sort of thing. So ironically, this whole AI thing seems to have shined a bit of a spotlight on Google's uh, EEAT uh, emphasis over the past couple of years, but uh, <laughs> that's probably a topic <laughs> for a different day. Um, yeah. Hey James, where can um, people follow along with what you're doing? Where can they uh, catch up with you? I, I know I caught up with you on Twitter, and, and caught wind of this, this cool story, but where else can people follow along with what you're doing? Yeah. So if you just search James Beatty on YouTube or Twitter, it's James Y Beatty. And I don't know if you put links down below or whatever, but, uh, yeah, they're the, they're the two main places you can find me. And from there, you'll be able to find anything else I do. I don't have any products or anything right now. So it's just, just sharing the journey. I do have a newsletter, um, where I'm kind of documenting this process of building the portfolio back up. I'm starting from scratch again and, and just sharing that, that whole journey uh, over there. Back to the beginnings, but with, um, yep. with, with a lot more experience under your belt now. <laughs> That's it. Hey, James, thanks so much for sharing your story. Like I said, I really appreciate you coming on board and not only sharing the highs, but some of the lows. 
we can all learn from both sides of the story and hearing both sides is really helpful. So thanks for coming on and congratulations again. Thank you. I appreciate it. Introducing nichesites.com. Are you looking to scale your niche site portfolio or build your first website? Look no further than nichesites.com. With a portfolio of successful websites and over 700 plus satisfied clients, the folks at nichesites.com have the skills and experience to help you succeed. From keyword research to link building, content writing to done for you websites, nichesites.com offers a full range of services to help your content site grow. As the saying goes, a trial is worth more than a thousand words and they're offering a special trial just for new customers. You get 5,000 words of content completely free with your order of 10,000 plus traffic backlinks. Don't miss this opportunity. Head on over to nichesites.com slash trial and take advantage of this amazing trial offer. Again, it's niche sites, plural, nichesites.com slash trial. Go claim your free content today. Today's episode is sponsored by Search Intelligence. Here's a short clip of Ferry from Search Intelligence showing you how their agency built digital PR links to a client's website. High tier backlinks in publications such as Daily Post, MSN, Birmingham Mail, and many more. Let me show you how we've done it. The campaign was pretty simple. We looked at the number of Instagram followers for each contestant in the Dancing on Ice show that aired in January. We sorted the contestants by the most popular ones. Now we've had the most influential Dancing on Ice contestant. Then we've also used an Instagram earnings calculator to calculate how much every contestant could make from one post on Instagram based on the number of their followers and engagement rate. Then we put these findings in a nice press release and an email and we found the relevant journalists with a tool called Roxhill where we looked at journalists who covered the show in the past 30 days and sent the findings and the press release to these journalists. And then the links started landing like this and this and this and many more. I hope this inspires and shows you that you can build links with simple and basic campaigns. If you want similar link building PR campaigns for your website, head to search-intelligence.co.uk and get in touch with them now.